founders who understand that they need the right people at their table with them. That's what makes you successful is bringing the right folks around you. It's the founders who try to keep everything close to their chest and not bring on advisors. And you tend to see multi-time founders realize that they would rather have a smaller slice of a much bigger pie. And it's those individuals who know how to bring people at the table with them that are much higher in success because they have more people who want to see them succeed at the end of the day. And that's what you need to bring these things to life. Welcome to the Unlearn Podcast, where host Barry O'Reilly seeks to synthesize the superpowers of extraordinary individuals to think big, start small, and learn fast. Here's your host, Barry O'Reilly. Welcome to the Unlearn Podcast. On this show, I'm delighted to be joined by Marcus Fernandez, Managing Partner at Fiat Ventures. Now, Fiat Growth and Fiat Ventures focus on helping founders, brands, and growing teams build for impact within the financial services space. And as a managing partner at Fias Ventures, Marcus helps advise, invest, and accelerate companies in the next wave of innovation in the digital sector. Now, today's VC market is competitive more than ever, and the ability for businesses to differentiate themselves or clarity around positioning themselves about the best founders to work with them is key. And what really struck me about Fiat Ventures and Fiat Growth a consulting agency they've built that focuses on high growth acceleration consulting services as a way to de-risk businesses before investing in Fiat Ventures really struck me as a unique way to go about it. Marcus's career is interesting. He's been at KPMG, SoFi and Ripple before joining and co-founding Fiat with his friends. So before we get started, let's talk a little bit about one of the seminal moments that helped him recognize about the path he wanted to take going forward. One of my mentors at the time who was in venture and someone who I'd go to for advice. I'd know that I wanted to get into venture capital, but to your point in my mind, it was a very different path. I was an operator and I was thinking about what does life look like after Ripple? That's when I was in the crypto space. And I had some really great opportunities and job offers to go and, and just continue my path within crypto and within FinTech. And I was talking to this mentor, I said, listen, but really my goal in life is to be in venture. Outside of my day job, I'm advising and writing small angel checks into these companies. And I come out of these meetings on such a high, like, I just wish I could do that all day. And then the best question ever, he said, well, what's keeping you from just doing that? In my head, I was like, oh, well, there's all these different things and all these different things. And very respectfully, he said, you know, I'll stop here real quick. If what you want to do is venture, wouldn't it be unfortunate if you went into venture and waited a decade to do that only to find out that isn't what you actually wanted to do? I was like, that's pretty good. And he said, if you want to do venture, do venture. And very serendipitously, my two co-founders, we'd already been talking. It had been in the back of my head of what they had started was this consultancy. And I know we'll go into it, but they had collected all these rights to invest and wanted to start a fund. And these are people that I've known and trusted for many years and worked alongside was an early advisor. So I came out of that call saying, you know what? If what I want to do is venture. Maybe I'll just do venture. And I was very lucky to have an opportunity that came about, but to your point, it's not a traditional path of getting into the space. And you know what? I've learned a ton in the last two years. Some of it is great. Some of it is not as great, but it does reaffirm that this is what I want to be doing for the rest of my career. And I'm so grateful to people who could help me see that light at the time and not wait for the best moment to do it, but to kind of take your future into your hands and make it happen. Yeah. Now, right on. Tell us a little bit about the process. It sounds like you had a vision over the long term that you wanted to spend time in venture capital, but you were also like a builder, it sounds like. How did you sort of frame that up in your own mind? How did you decide this is the place I want to go? Like what attracted you to it? What was sort of different? Very early on, I, I know in my mind, at least, everyone wants to be a founder. You want to go out and you want to create the next great company. And I was so fortunate to work alongside such incredible founders at both SoFi and Ripple. And as I was advising companies at early stages like Brex and these kind of shooting stars within fintech. And I realized I'm not a founder. Like I aspire to surround myself with founders with these incredible visionaries, but my strengths aren't necessarily in bringing that to life. It's in finding them, it's in backing them, it's in helping them operate and knowing how to identify these opportunities. And that's really over that time in practice where I realized venture is where I want to be because certainly I'm a founder in my own right of bringing this venture capital fund to life alongside my two partners. And you know, we also have this growth consultancy that we're bringing to life alongside more partners and a lot of smart people. But 
really my calling is to work with these incredible visionaries. And I feel so grateful that the analogy I always use is sometimes VCs think they're the rock stars. They think that they're the ones that people come to the show for, but we're the roadies. Our job is to set up the stage and get the venue set up. We're creating financial structures and providing a whole ecosystem to these founders, these rock stars to bring it to life. I'm a much better roadie than I am a rock star. And I think over time, it's a practice of advising and doing these investments and being an operator to realize that. So that's what kind of spurred me to want to make sure that we could bring this to life. So making that shift from being an operator to an investor, what were some of the things that made you successful as an operator, but actually limited your success when you sort of flipped over to the investor type mode? As an operator, it's a lot of MVP mentality of like, let's just get this up off the ground to make it happen. And then we're going to figure it out and build it on the fly. And that doesn't work as much with an investing. What we had to do is pump the brakes on several things and have learned a ton even over the last couple of years, because we want to make sure that we are always long-term stewards of other people's capital. So in startup mode, it's break it, see what works, what doesn't work, and then move on. When you're an investor, however, you can't go and break it. Like you have to put the right processes in place when you're doing due diligence, when you're doing things like standard background checks, all this little minutia that you need to bring to the table that you need to make sure that you have in place. As an operator, you know, I done a lot of investments when I was at Ripple, helped work on a ton when I was at SoFi. Very different mentality. It's one balance that you're pulling from. In this case, and it's not an angel investment, it's not your personal balance sheet. It's really strong, limited partners and investors who trust us with their capital. And I think a lot of our foundations is we always try to build these processes that make it feel like we're actually on a fund four or five, and really we're on one moving into a two. That's probably the biggest thing is like, there is something to be said about process. And before, sometimes I would try to break it as an operator to move quickly to make things happen. I'm on the flip side now. I'm the one who's building out the processes to make sure that we build these really sustainable investment models. If you started off the growth agency, I guess, you advising companies on their growth to market, on helping them build content and social systems and raising awarenesses of the brand. And what helps give you confidence as you see some companies that you work with through that process, is that what gets you excited about them and going, okay, this is an early stage business. They've got a good value proposition. We're helping them define it. Now we're going to take some of our working capital from that business and invest it in them to help them go faster. Short answer is yes, absolutely. So what we've done is we've built out a full stack growth engine. So what we say is from performance to partnerships, to marketing tech stack implementation, we're not just advising you, we're hands-on keyboards, helping you actually bring that to life. Full funnel. So attracting people to your platform, converting them referrals. We've hired executives from across FinTech to come in and build these out. So that gives us a really huge advantage. But interestingly enough, it's not the growth indicators that give us the best conviction behind fundraising and behind deploying capital into these companies. It's the intangibles. Are the co-founders getting along with each other? Do the founders or CEO know where their gaps are and know how to fill that with the right teams? Are they open and receptive to feedback? It's all of these things that we've seen past rock stars in our lives. So myself at SoFi and Ripple, well, Alex is the former head of growth at Chime. We've got the former heads of life cycle from Credit Karma. We have all these people that have seen this before. So yes, we're investing in these teams where, man, they're just absolutely rocket shipping. They're getting customers at a fifth of the acquisition cost of their nearest competitors. They figured something out, but also at is this the team we want to back? Are these founders that we have a ton of conviction behind? And that ultimately is like our secret sauce. So it's not just, is it growing? And is this a really cool marketing company? It's, is that team the one that we want to invest in? And that's what gives us the conviction to both put money in, but also in primarily most cases, not invest. That's, I think the unique bit here. This model of when you're actually working with the teams for a period of time, where you actually get to know them, you understand the chemistry that you've got essentially, as you say, a frame of reference that you use as a team to say, right, like, do we have conviction on this business and where it can go? It's interesting that you offer that, if you will, as sort of like the consultancy model to start. And then when you get confidence in them, that you have a fund, if you will, to like sort of go, right, this is a great startup. This is a great team. We're working together. Great as a partnership. Let's have even more conviction. That's kind of interesting then to flip from like offering services to like offering capital to these businesses. How do startups find that value proposition? 
because it that's interesting to me to think about how you're both de-risking on both sides. You're working together, you're figuring out if there's a fit, if everyone's sort of excited or conviction, again, is a word I'd love to use too as well, then you sort of double down and go for it. That's a great way to go. Yeah. And you said it well, like for us, it helps us make sure that we're investing in fundamentals and not trends or not what you see, because we have really good access to information, not just in those teams, but in some of the sub verticals that are emerging. Before right. we deploy a dollar, we can work alongside teams to see, is this generally a market we want to get exposure to? And sometimes we say no, but sometimes we say yes, but we're working with the wrong team. So now let's go engage with those that we think are the right teams. So of the investments we made, about 55% of those are existing clients. There's another 45 that we're investing in who weren't prior clients. In those cases, we're able to get the allocation that we're looking for because they see that we have this massive engine we can bring to the table. That's kind of the idea is they know it's not just a check and it's not just fintech experts, but we have this growth engine that they can then start to tap into. And that just makes us smarter investors. Does that mean that we're 10 out of 10 and we're batting a thousand? Not at all. But in this game of venture, the idea isn't that you need to get even the majority of your investments right. It's that we are always looking for these exceptional outsized returns. We're looking for the 50 to 100 extras of the world. And this does give us a very discernible advantage in identifying those and then helping turn them into those. So it's de-risking before, during, and and post-investment. And for us, that's really what we're kind of leaning into on our side with this model. And that's what we unlearn, right? Because traditionally, VC is find a trend, find a team, invest, and then help make them successful. We're trying to unlearn it where it's like, no, work beside teams, learn about it, a market, think about investing, make the investment, then turn them into winners. Yeah, right on. That's very similar to what we do in Nobody, because we're a venture studio. So If you imagine like we're a mix of venture capital with an incubator and accelerator all rolled into one. So when companies come in or we meet teams or we have our own ideas, there's like a series of small deliverables that we work on together to get to know each other. That's actually, we found to be the best way to de-risk both the relationship, both the idea, both the investment from a financial point of view as well. So like we have a five-stage process for building companies from ideating to concepting, launching it, and then ultimately looking for external capital. And at each one of those stages, the teams have sort of like a mission that they've got to complete. Like an ideation, they're mapping out what their idea is, their differentiator, who the competitors are and what their value prop might be. And we often spend like anywhere from a week to two weeks working with the team to do that. So instantly you start testing the rapport, you start getting a sense of the team. And as you say, the idea at that stage is probably the least important part. It's just like, is it something that we believe could be a business that we get excited about? Then our next stage is when we start to concept these things is actually, we'll probably double the investment. It might even be just as simple as $10,000 just to do like a couple of weeks work to map out the product and what its go to market might be. It's really interesting to hear that you're taking that slant as a business, but very much from a gross marketing point of view. You've got a lot of these people in your team who've led those roles in successful startups. As a founder, I know what I'm getting. I'm getting this great capability around growth marketing, and you're getting this chance to work with these founders. So again, the value proposition, if you will, that whatever the entity is, whether it's a venture capital firm or it's a venture studio, even angel investors, to your point earlier, this notion of it has to be more than just a check. It has to be like a value exchange about what people can bring to the table and get the best of both worlds, both from the collaboration and the capabilities people offer. That for me is a huge shift from what you find is more and more founders are becoming aware of. It's about building a whole team and people who would be on the journey with you. We see that again and again. It's a great way to find out if it's a right fit for a partnership in the cycles, I guess, you're dealing with is you're talking seven to 10 years. It's a long time to be on these journeys together and you need to de-risk that somehow. Yeah, absolutely. They're long journeys and it's more volatile in the beginning than it ever will be. So I like the model that you had applied as well to be able to de-risk it from the earliest sides and put some thought into it. But I mean, you said a lot that I agree with, but the one thing that really stands out, and this is what we look for too, it, founders who understand that they need the right people at their table with them. That's what makes you successful is bringing the right folks around you. It's the founders who try to keep everything close to their chest and not bring on advisors. And you tend to see multi-time founders realize that they would rather have a smaller slice of a much bigger pie. And it's those individuals who know how to bring 
people at the table with them that are much higher in success because they have more people who want to see them succeed at the end of the day. And that's what you need to bring these things to life. I would see great capability around growth marketing, which is a huge part, especially of SaaS businesses. So how do you help bring more people to that table? You're obviously become a trusted member of that group, especially from the earliest days. What are some of the things that you look for or other people in your network, if you will, that you start to feed people into the team as you try to grow it? So initially, and this is one thing we had to unlearn, a lot of it was just, hey, this company is looking for this role. Do we know anyone? And you get in a room with three, four, five of you and you brainstorm. That works when you're working with a handful of portfolio companies and founders, but then it, you have to think about how can you scale that? That's what we've recently been spending a lot of time investing in is this new wing of our business we call Fiat Advisory. And essentially, these are the people that we would go to. These are the hundreds of CROs, COOs, VPs of these operators who want to get involved in our ecosystem. But you've got to find ways to make that scalable. So we've invested in technologies that help us make sure that we can do that for any founder or, or company that wants to work alongside us. And have hired out teams to bring that to life to be able to really help connect the dots in a much more seamless fashion. So anytime like one of the three partners, if we sponsor a deal, if we take a board seat or a board observer seat, we're going to be much more compelled to want to help bring those companies to life. And we're a little bit more engaged and hands-on. But as we're building this out over time, we're also thinking about what are like the systems that we can put into place, to replace ourselves in our networks so that you don't have to rely on us to take a look at something and brainstorm three or four people we can kind of put that into a repository so it's easily searchable. That's been a huge differentiator. We've definitely seen in Nobody is often people want to work with their peers and they get excited, not only just contributing to the companies, but like that they can be part of a wider mastermind of folks that are in the domain that they're fascinated by. It's really interesting just to see all these new layers that are starting to appear about beyond just folks that are looking to raise capital and funds to work on their business. But what's actually the whole package, if you will, that different business partners ultimately offer? From your example, this expertise in growth marketing has been your way to sort of test out the quality of the company, the team, your conviction on the idea. And likewise, those teams then understanding the capabilities you really offer. So when you go on to, as you say, making a financial backing of those companies that sort of establishes it but that it doesn't just end there that there's more things to keep bringing to the table as those companies grow whether it's access to talent which is a huge one as you're trying to scale the businesses whether it's like great networks of people that can sign the business partnership deals that can get the enterprise deals that they need especially in fintech i imagine how is that starting to play because i imagine that's got to be a fun part about thinking about how you can leverage your networks to create more opportunities for those businesses to sign whatever it might be, larger enterprise deals, greater customers. How have you guys tried to tackle that? It's actually been one of the things that I hold near and dear to my heart, having been a former BD and partnerships person. And we're very fortunate where a part of our fiat growth consulting business is focused on strategic partnerships. So we've got a team of people who do nothing all day, but help fintechs better connect to corporate partners, card networks, banks, all the way down to regional credit unions. And they're already building out these relationships. And it's very, very organic with our fund then, both from people who want to invest in our fund, these corporate venture arms, because they see the access that we have. And then the portfolio companies that we invest in who want to tap back into it. It's really become a great flywheel for us and another one of these strength points of ours where we know everyone in FinTech, we know everyone across financial services from these large to mid-sized banks to insurance and reinsurance providers to the largest credit unions. It's our job to make sure we are constantly building relationships. But unlike others who maybe want to build a relationship with one particular thing in mind, I'm a VC and I want you to invest in me, so I'm going to do this. Or I'm, I'm a startup and I want you to use this product. We can have these conversations it's so much more organic because we can talk about everything from investments to co-investments to what trends are we seeing to who can we make introductions for? By the way, have you heard about this? It really helps heighten our whole brand. And so I am fortunate where I have a lot of these relationships and, and I'm constantly opening doors and connecting dots, but we also have these incredibly bright and talented individuals who spend all day, every day focusing on just that. That's really what makes us really powerful because as that team expands, not only do we have tech that can help with it, 
but we've got more people that we can hire and bring on who specialize in that. And that just makes the whole ecosystem a little bit bigger and better. Great. So looking ahead, what are some of the things that you're most excited about on the horizon? Like, what are some of the things that are sort of excited for you, especially in the fintech space? Yeah. I'll tell you, our vantage point is not from reading trends or looking at VC Twitter. It's from hands-on with these companies. Our core thesis is that financial technology is a core instrument across every industry. The first wave of fintech was the great unbundling of financial services. You saw banking apps, checking apps, credit cards, all these different things that took these previous products that were fully bundled and really, really lack of transparency and made it a lot more approachable. The next wave is going to be very different. The next wave is going to make it very seamless for all of us to transact and have our financial lives through every different types of mean. A great intersection point that we use is healthcare and finance. Today, the number one fintech in healthcare is still GoFundMe. That means that something is broken, at least here in the US. And that means that there's a lot of processing around payments or insurance or data that can help transform these industries. There's some phenomenal examples of founders who are out there really changing that. We're focused on a lot of enterprise solutions. So a lot of embedded services that enable financial services to become more efficient. It enables other non-fintechs to become more fintech friendly. So long-winded way of saying wave 1.0 is in your face. You're looking at commercials of it and they're trying to attract you on all sorts of platforms. The next wave is going to be much more behind the scenes. And it's going to enable these non-financial enterprises to deliver a great customer experience. And on the back end, there's going to be a lot of really cool companies that are bringing that to life. There's also a lot going on internationally, right? So we are focusing on markets like Latin America, Southeast Asia, Europe, Africa. There's some phenomenal examples of innovation happening there because there are so many efficiencies outside of the U.S. within those markets, including real-time payments rails, better access to certain financial products. That's also a place where we spend a lot of time and always love learning about what's happening there. And a lot of times you see that innovation being applicable back in our own market back home. What are some of those startups that stand out to you and what are they doing differently? I'll give you one example. In the U.S., fertility financing is broken. Also, people are waiting longer to start families and it's also really expensive. You can spend easily over 50000 up to over 100000 to try to raise a family and start a family only to have it fail, which leaves you like emotionally and economically in ruin. This company called Sunfish, incredible founder who spent her entirety of her career at the intersection of business and fertility. She's creating a product that is the first in market to give you a guarantee on that treatment. What that means tactically is if you go out there and try several different IVF treatments only to fail, then they will guarantee a portion of that so that it doesn't leave you as much financially in ruin. That's like the first that's ever been created globally and certainly here in the U.S. to be able to create that type of guarantee for aspiring families. That's one example. I'll give you another one. Sigo Seguros, they're an auto insurance company that's doing the first digital auto insurance package focused on Hispanic Americans. I know this having grown up on the border in El Paso and being close to this community. And what's crazy is still really up until recently, people were still going to these brick and mortar stores to access their entire financial suite because they just don't trust traditional financial services. In some cases are underwritten inappropriately. Enter the pandemic, which forced everyone to do finances online. They're reaching this brand new audience that's not just like a big one, but Hispanics in the state of Texas where they're live just became the majority of the population. And just across the United States, you're about to see 50 million new drivers on the road over the next decade. And so it's these really cool intersection points that we're constantly looking for, both because there's good to be done here. You're reaching this population that's largely been left out, but also because there's a huge opportunity for what investors call alpha for looking for these returns. It's one way that we view the world that, you know, it's possible to do good and get great returns at the same time. And I could keep going with you, Barry, for the next like three hours on just some of these incredible rock stars that we get to set up these stages around. But that's what gets me really excited is not just the monetary benefit of what they're building, but the real lasting impact that it has on those end consumers. Yeah, no, and they're great examples. That's the stuff that helps people get their head into what we're doing and how you can help them. And it's super to hear. Those are the kind of areas that you're focused on. If there's one lesson that you would encourage other people who are maybe interested in that path of starting off and working their way through it to where you are today, what's probably been the main thing you've had to unlearn that you would encourage other folks maybe to think about? Yeah, I thought about this one just having listened to your podcast. And one thing I'd kind of leave away as it relates to unlearning 
is some of the best advice I ever got from Kahina Van Dyke. She was my former manager when I was at Ripple. She's an incredible fintech rock star. And I would close a deal and feel like good about it, but I've always been hungry for the next. She said, great work, but people are going to always judge you by what's coming next. So she was like, so what's coming next? And I was like, well, let me pull up my pipeline and all this. And ah, yeah, yeah, she, she knew me though. So she wasn't like, hey, good job, what's next? She'd be like, hey, if you know that we're all getting judged by what's around the corner. <laughs> That's great. She said this, don't get distracted. Don't confuse being busy with being productive. Because at these points, when you close these deals, you may confuse the two. You may feel good and sit on your loyals. What she said was this, and this is the advice I've given is, every morning when you wake up, what is the one thing you need to do today? Not or what are the many things, but what is the one most important thing? On every Monday morning, what's the most important thing you can do this week? At the beginning of the month, what's the most important thing I need to do this month? What's the most important thing I need to do this quarter? What's the number one thing I need to do this year? And if it doesn't align to these things, deprioritize it and get off your plate. Don't be busy, be productive. And when it comes to unlearning, I think we can all kind of take something from that, right? Where we may learn these habits of what has gotten us successful in the past, and it may have worked in the past, but the past doesn't really matter anymore. Like you got to go out there and get the next one that's ahead of you. We have a wonderful, fun one announcement. We have incredible backers and entrepreneurs that we've done, but I'm focused on what's coming next too, right? And getting out there and again, every day, every week, every month, every quarter, every year, what do I need to do to bring this to life? So that's the long-winded way of saying Focus on what's most important and don't get distracted by the shiny object. It's funny you remind me, Jeff Redfern, who's the former chief product officer at Glassian and LinkedIn. I was at an event with them and he has this little block that he gives people, which is just, you can only put one thing on it. It's like a little index card holder. And he's like, every day, this is the little thing I use where you can just stick one thing on your desk. That is, this is the thing, if I can get this done today how that's going to help me make progress. And, you know, it, it's funny, I still have it here today. And it's a great way, I think, as well, to help people get into that. So love it. All right, so Marcus, thanks for being on the show. Great insights. What's the best way that people can get in touch with you? Yeah, absolutely. Listen, if you're a founder out there who's looking to build the next great fintech or consumer focus or B2B business, like we'd love to be a part of your journey. You can find out more about us at fiatgrowth.com. That's our growth consultancy. You can see examples of the work that we do and get in touch with our team. On the venture side, that's fiat.bc. You can get to both sites from the same nav, but ultimately, if you're looking to raise capital or building at the early stage, we'd love to talk to you too. You can submit there on the website or get in touch with us at hello at fiat.bc and follow us on all different social apps. We've got a great monthly newsletter as well. So Listen, if you want to learn more and keep in touch in our ecosystem, you can find tons online. Super. All right. Look forward to people doing that. Thank you very much. Awesome. Thanks, Barry. Hey, everyone. I hope you enjoyed that show, but I'm even more delighted to share the exciting news. I've recently co-founded a new venture studio named Nobody Studios. Now, Venture Studio is a vehicle for the rapid creation of new companies from ideation to acceleration and growth. And our purpose at Nobody Studios will be to de-risk pre-seed stage business ideas. We'll do this by minimizing the time, speed, and capital involved in validating truly repeatable and scalable business models before any significant venture investment. We've an audacious goal to start 100 compelling companies over the next five years, and who knows how many beyond that. So if you're interested in radically changing the way work is done, how products are created, companies built and funded, even democratizing the wealth creation and how returns are distributed, this could be the business for you. We're looking for talent, capital, and influence. If you wish to contribute any or all of these, just get in touch. You can follow us on nobodystudios.com, on our LinkedIn page, all the social media accounts, or simply my newsletters and what I'm sharing. We'll be launching a truly innovative crowdfunding campaign and I'd be honored if you'd be willing to join us on this journey and become a nobody yourself.